um, CEO, of, uh, CEO of Global Fishing Watch to join us. The second time we are now calling on, on Pierre Garou, from CTO at Maritime Data Systems. Um, we have Jean Gouchot. I'm sure I misspelled your name. So you are the uh, CEO at Yoden. Um, yeah, then. Okay. And Felix Mesentin, who is um, sales director at Weatherdog. And so this this last session is about, um, as I said, supporting sustainability. Looking forward um, to. Uh, addressing the challenges um, that are really, truly global challenges and where these, these people hopefully have their contributions. Uh, I don't know about the sequence uh, of the presentation, but I think it's Paul first. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, if you'd like to take a seat. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Carson, for uh, uh, inviting me to come here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I uh, was here uh, three years ago, I think, at the, uh, at the last one. And uh, when I came there, we were just um, getting this Global Fishing Watch project up and running. And um, <clears throat> now I'm uh, uh, pleased to tell you about where we are today uh, and what we're doing. So I'm uh, just a correction. I'm, I'm not the CEO. I'm the CTO. Um, that was that was printed printed incorrectly. I think Carson was just feeling generous. Um, I was the interim CEO last year when we stood up the company, um, and uh, since then we brought in uh, Tony Long from uh, Pew's um, End Illegal Fishing Program, who's now the CEO of Global Fishing Watch. And okay, there we go. So Global Fishing Watch. So what is it? Um, uh, so our vision, our goal with uh, Global Fishing Watch was uh, was ba really based on the realization that um, AIS is a global tool that illuminates where a lot of large-scale commercial fishing happens. It was, the vision was really based on the success of another project uh, called Global Forest Watch, which was supported by Google um, and uh, basically took uh, Landsat satellite imagery and made a, a uniform uh, product for deforestation detection uh, globally and then packaged it up, put in a nice map, and gave it away on the Internet for free. Uh, and um, and we were very impressed with uh, some of the impacts they were able to uh, uh, to create and the way they were able to move governments to better management uh, through um, through better data on the one hand and also the um, uh, enforced transparency on the other hand, uh, which would illuminate um, where things maybe weren't being as managed as well as they could be. Uh, so we looked when we um, uh, when I was at SkyTruth and we discovered uh, AIS data, satellite AIS data. This was in 2013. Uh, we got really excited because we sort of saw the potential to do something similar. Uh, and so this is the result. Uh, so each one of the dots up there is a fishing event, uh, and that's a, a one-month window um, moving through um, the most 2017. Um, and um, um, so you can see the patterns and how things move around. Uh, so SkyTruth was, um, uh, sorry, uh, Global Fishing Watch was started uh, as a partnership of two NGOs, SkyTruth and Oceana, uh, and then Google is a technology partner. It's not a Google platform. Um, it's not owned by Google. Google doesn't get any of the data. They just give us a lot of technology for free, uh, and we use it to do what we do. Um, <clears throat> so um, the project is entirely philanthropically funded. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation uh, and Bloomberg being the two lead funders, and then uh, several other uh, other foundations, most recently Walmart Foundation, uh, has given us a grant to study um, the intersection between uh, what we can track in commercial fishing and human rights problems in uh, the tuna supply chain. So um, uh, in 2015, we stood up a prototype of this product, and that is actually what we showed uh, when we came here. Uh, and then uh, we had a public launch in fall of 2016 where we, we made the first version of it available to the public, uh, and that was our global fishing activity data set. Uh, then in 2017, um, we decided that, that things were going well enough that we could actually spin the project out into its independent NGO, which is what we've done. So this globalfishingwatch.org is now its own thing. Um, and, um, and then in 2017, we also um, uh, engaged with the Indonesian government to have them add their proprietary VMS data, their, their national vessel monitoring system data, to the public data set. 
Uh, and so we throw it in there with all the AIS and that added uh, several thousand more vessels in Indonesia, uh, which uh, now are uh, effectively publicly trackable and the fishing activity is, is public. Uh, and now in 2018, um, we are really beginning to see the fruits of the, uh, of the, of the product, uh, producing uh, some major research outputs um, in uh, scientific journals, science, nature, science advances. Uh, we, uh, um, and, uh, oh yeah, and then uh, some new work on transshipment. So we've created a new layer in the product that shows encounters between fishing vessels and refrigerated cargo vessels. Uh, some of which, some of those encounters involve transshipment of catch. There's nothing wrong with transshipment. It's perfectly legal most of the time, uh, but um, uh, sometimes it's not. And a, lo a lot of people are trying to get a handle on it because it's um, uh, generally not well um, documented and reported uh, when and where this is, where it's going on. So the idea with the public platform, it's global. Um, so there are about 60,000 uh, commercial fishing vessels in there, mostly large vessels, 24 meters and, and, and larger, that use AIS. Um, it's uh, 10,000 of those are Chinese MMSIs in and around China, and we really don't know what they're doing uh, very much at all. So uh, it gets a little fuzzy when you get out to the, the long tail of fishing vessels there. Uh, but it's near real time. We publish everything three hour, with a, with a three-day delay. Um, and this is uh, part of the license uh, that, we, uh, that we set up with the AIS providers. And um, also, but also we, we do not treat, we do not um, intend for this platform to be a, a, a monitoring control and surveillance tool. It's not for real-time surveillance. That's not why we're doing it. And so we don't publish real-time data. Uh, we do make use of real-time data internally. Um, <clears throat> uh, it was designed to be easy to use and most importantly, free to everybody. And that's why it has to be philanthropically funded because uh, uh, giving stuff away for free is not much of a business model. Uh, so there you go. Everybody knows what that looks like. Uh, this is the part where I explain what AS is, but I can skip that now. That's great. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is all 300,000 or so MMSIs running around for a world, uh, running around the world. Um, so we, when we started with AIS, we, we uh, went to Orbcom and uh, we told them what we wanted to do and they said, well, that sounds a little crazy, but um, we'll give you some data and you can play with it and let's see what you can do with it. Uh, and that uh, research license turned into our production license uh, and that's been going very well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so now we're, you know, we're processing all the Orbcom data as it comes in. Then in 2017, we added Spire, and so we've merged those two data sets together, and that gives us a really nice, complete picture um, and uh, solves, a lot, solves a lot of the, the challenges with uh, satellite coverage. Um, we don't use exact earth data in the product, but we do use exact earth, uh, the, their uh, excellent ship view product for real-time uh, monitoring uh, and uh, analysis that we do. So the basic idea of the whole thing, and this was the fundamental realization that led to the product, is if you look at AS vessel, AS tracks of uh, fishing vessels, you can tell when they're fishing, and you can tell um, often what kind of gear they're using, what kind of fishing vessel it is. So that there's a trawler on the left, a longliner in the middle, a person on the right. Uh, the longliner particularly, it's really easy to tell which bits are the fishing uh, and which bits are not. Um, and the person here, you can see the, the circle, that's actually the circle they do um, prior to the set um, where they're, they're, they're uh, going around the school of fish. Uh, so what we did is we um, developed some machine learning models with help from uh, for friends at Google um, that, uh, and we labeled a whole lot of these. Uh, we had a bunch of uh, undergrads uh, at many universities uh, taking these, these tracks, labeling them with the, you know, based on the, uh, uh, the data we had about the vessel. Uh, identifying where the fishing is, and then we fed that all into the machine learning models, which we've been um, evolving and tuning over time. Uh, and so the result is the map. So each one of those, yeah, I mentioned before, is a fishing event. Each dot on the map is a fishing event. You can zoom in all the way in on the map, um, and the the, the uh, Indonesia VMS is that orange, that, that yellow green stuff, the different color over there. Uh, that's the same thing produced from the VMS data. Um, this is the encounters data. So we also then publish on the same map. Uh, encounters between vessels, and uh, just like with the fishing data, you, you can zoom in on any given event on the map, click in, see which vessels uh, were involved. You can see the historic tracks of those vessels, um, and so um, and so that's that's the basic tool. Uh, we're also working on some uh, dark target detection with uh, with lights at night, so we can detect non-broadcasting vessels. Uh, we made a preliminary layer in Global Fishing Watch, but that's a really a in development kind of thing. Uh, particularly since our challenge is we want to produce a product that we can give away to the world for free, uh, which means we can't use 
commercial SAR, for example, that would be uh, prohibitively expensive. Uh, so our research program, um, uh, several major universities, uh, we work a lot with uh, uh, Stanford, um, UC Santa Barbara, um, I don't have CFAS up there, we just uh, started a, a project with uh, CFAS in the UK. Um, and uh, so this year we've had, we've had um, uh, six major uh, papers published, uh, including our, our own paper where we, uh, which we publish in Science, where we, where we document the methods the machine learning methods that we use, and the and then we describe some of the uh, uh, some of the things you can tell looking at the data. Uh, and one of the things we learned, of course, is that it's, since it's big vessels, fishing on the high seas is really um, where it does best. Uh, and uh, several of the papers um, that have been done on this, looking at the economics of the high seas, very interesting paper looking at that using our data, uh, which was, it was not possible to do the study prior to the aggregation of the data that we did. Uh, but they compared subsidies of uh, of distant water fleets, the coming national subsidies that are paid, fuel and, and uh, production subsidies, and um, then looked at fishing on the high seas, estimated fuel consumption based on the AIS data, and concluded that most of the fishing that happens on the high seas is uneconomical without the subsidies. Uh, and that's a, that's a very interesting outcome and feeds directly into the UN negotiations that are happening right now on whether and how to manage and regulate fishing on the high seas, so which is 40% of the planet. So very exciting. Um, and uh, I think I'll stop there and um, hand off to the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, it really is a privilege that uh, you were just saying 2015, you were prototyping this, and there we had you already in the AIS Summit um, um, showing what you were just developing. And now it's there, and it's. Uh, it's operational. Very good. Thank you very much. And we'll talk about this later uh, in more detail. So over to Pierre, and I think I got the CTO right in this case uh, of uh, Maritime Data Systems. Thank you. I'll say a word. So, hi, my name my name is Pierre. Uh, I'm the CTO of Maritime Data Systems. So, you've heard about Maritime Data Systems a little bit throughout the two days. First, through Carsten's opinions and comments and questions, and uh, you saw Jonas's uh, talk a little bit earlier on IOTA. So, just a word about Maritime Data Systems. Um, it's really an incubator of ideas in the maritime um, and a company builder. So inside that entity, there's three main projects that, we, um, that we've been working on. One of them is a, a routing um, project. Uh, it's called Sea Routes. There's a, we've built a recommendation engine for shipyards and for vessels to figure out where to go and um, which shipyard to go to so they don't get their engine stolen. So it's called Trusted Dogs. Um, and the application I'll show you now is um, very similar to what Paul just um, has shown Great, amazing. So it's called Tug in Motion, and it's great that I have it uh, up there. So here the idea is, uh, since we talked about the hackathon challenging challenges and uh, see how to address um, one of the topics that's been listed. So one of the topics is how to reduce fuel emissions in ports. So the, the premise behind this project is to say, how do you reduce CO2 emissions in a given port without killing business? And we've taken that approach uh, from the perspective of, of tug companies. So uh, after a port call, they have to pull in a vessel in the port, bring it to a, a, a berth, or to a dock, rather. Um, and when the vessel is done doing its thing, then it has to be pulled out, out sea. And so that job, that particular job, is done by fleets of tugs that operate in ports. And naturally, they're one of the main causes of CO2 emissions in a given port. 
So the question is, how can we optimize the behavior of these guys in a given port so that they have they reduce their fuel emissions? So, um, so the way a tug job works is there's a port call, vessel approaches, the tug leaves his um, resting area, goes pick up the vessel, does his job, and then goes back to his resting area. So there's there's two components: the going to the vessel and coming back to your resting areas that can't be optimized. And this is what we've been focusing on. So, um, so up there you see a live map of Hamburg. Um, this is actually our own AIS antenna that's plugged in our own AIS receiver coupled to a Raspberry Pi that gives us live positions. So here's the vessel approaching here. Maybe I can click on it. Okay, I don't click on it. So this is the live view of Hamburg. And so what we've done is from this AIS data, how do you recognize the tug jobs? And so in that sense, we've used the same family of algorithm that's been used to detect illegal fishing activities. So the same way you can detect um, movements of vessels and, and figure out that they're actually fishing, you can detect movements of vessels altogether to figure out that this is actually a tug job. So what does a tug job look like? So let's go down. This is Hamburg today. So I have a nice list of jobs that happened. AIS is open data, so I see all the companies in the port operating here, and I see all the way down here a French vessel, which I'm gonna click on just to advertise CMA, even though I don't work for them. Um, so here's, here's a, a, the job, so it's gonna load. You get the vessel here that's at the dock. There's two tug jobs that are at their resting areas respectively, and they're gonna go and fetch that vessel. Okay, so that computer is a bit slow, so there's kind of a little bit of a feedback. So what they do is they're going to pull the vessel out of the dock and bring it at sea so it's on the Elba, rather, so that vessel is ready to go. Okay, and after that, they go back to their berth area. Okay, so we, we've trained the system to recognize that. In essence, that's not so complicated to do. You can do it with families of algorithms that are already open source. Google has beautiful libraries that do that for you. Um, but we've plugged in another layer on top of this, which is um, uh, proprietary tide models. So once you have the exact movements of the tugs, then the next question is how much fuel do they actually spend on their job? And the way you do this is by computing the actual speed of the different tugs through the water, not the GPS, right, through the water. So by uh, basically reverse engineering um, the actual speed through water by kind of cross-referencing the speed over ground and the tides, we get the actual speed through water. We can plug in the exact fuel consumption curve from, a, uh, from the different tugs, and then we generate reports. So I'll plug in the reports here. So here's the job. You see it um, in blue in the middle. There's two mobilization. So this is the movements of the tugs to the vessels. And on the right, in red here, there's two demobilization where the tugs actually left the vessel and went back to their resting area. Okay, so what happened on that job? Well, it looks like the tugs left a little late and they had a rush to go get their vessel, not for too long, but you see that they went, one of them went way over 10 knots. So if he left a little bit earlier, he could have saved a bit of fuel here. And it's the same on the D-Mob, same tug was really rushed to go back home, maybe smoke a cigarette or something, just went all the way back to his berth really fast where he could have just cut down on the speed, maybe get there five minutes later, but the uh, fuel emissions would have been much, much lower. So we report this. Um, yeah, so then you have the exact timestamps of everything when, it, when it happens and we score them in terms of fuel efficiency and you can see here that vessel, not so fuel efficient. Okay, so that's interesting for two tug jobs, but obviously if you have this at the level of the fleet, that's more interesting for the fleet manager. So I'm gonna try here, this is live. Let's see if I click on this, if this works. It loads. So obviously if you have all these, this granularity at the job level, you can think about what do I have at the monthly level for my fleet? And so here, this, I'm not so sure which fleet that is. Let's, let's not put names in the port of Hamburg, but um, I'm displaying what happened the last three days. So this these Kotak. This ZP, yeah, ZP. Dutch. Okay, all right. If you're in the room, come talk to us. 
Um, so basically, this is what you see, that last three days worth of jobs for this particular fleet, so that's five tugs. I list all the jobs. So these are all the jobs, like I just showed you. I can see them in sequence, and I can see the mobilization and demobilization. The idea is to identify which jobs were inefficient. Then I can go talk to the captain of that particular tug, figure out why he was rushing. Maybe there's a solution for him to kind of decelerate a little bit, and then we'll save on fuel. So from the perspective of the operations manager, it's great. At the end of the month, we save $10,000 worth of fuel. And I save on CO2 emissions inside the port. So this is good for everybody that lives in Hafen City in Hamburg and has a beautiful penthouse right next to the ships and breathes all this polluted air. Okay. So, um, and uh, yeah, that gives metrics. So that's the dashboard approach to solving the problem. Yes, so that's basically it. I wanted to f uh, show you in the five minutes of time that I had one of the applications that we've been, or one of the products that we've been building at Maritime Data Systems, but there's lots of others. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and um, come talk to us if you have some ideas for the hackathon later. Thank you. <laughs> and let's directly yeah. move over to the next presentation, perhaps there's some little bit of uh, disengagement time or whatever he called it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yann Guichou. I'm the CEO of a French startup called Iodine. And this uh, company is uh, three years old. And we are based in Brest, in the far west of France, in Brittany. And we also have an office in Seattle. And uh, our core business is, of course, related to AS, but we are not using AS la as, as usual. So we have a specific, um, a, a specific business model on specific applications related to AS. We are dealing with ocean surface currents. So um, our main solution is relying on um, ocean surface currents and a, a measurement technique using AS signals. So just to, to give you a quick overview of the, the, the usual systems used to monitor ocean surface currents. You can use drifters. You can use also HF radars, which have to be installed uh, ashore. You can use uh, current meters. On, from space, you can use altimeters. So this is a, probably the, the, the most important part of the ocean surface current monitoring system at a global scale. You can use uh, satellite, uh, altimetry satellites. Of course, Eodyne does not have the financial power to, to develop and to, to launch such a system at a global scale, but we are able to monitor ocean surface currents in real time at a global scale thanks to AS. So um, our main markets are related to the maritime domain, uh, on everything in the maritime domain, because all these topics are interested in information on ocean surface currents. We can deal with shipping companies, the oil and gas sector, uh, fisheries, uh, scientists, uh, for search and rescue too, regarding um, the output of uh, drifting models, which are relying on uh, reliable or sensitive fast current information, and the oil spills, etc. So many, many applications related to the environment in the ocean. And um, so uh, I just told that we are using AS signals to, to measure and to estimate our sensitive fast currents. And the, the main point is that we are using ships as in situ sensors. So just by using a machine learning algorithm, we are able to retrieve information on the ocean dynamics at a global scale. So that's what you are going to see on the, on the next movie. So here you, you will see some, uh, some ships in, of the um, Algerian coastline. And thanks to our um, algorithm, we are able to retrieve information on ocean surface currents. And you can see some uh, red square, which are representing the speed of ocean currents. And we are able to, move, to visualize ocean features thanks to this, uh, this technology. You can see eddies, filaments in real time just by analyzing ship movements. And what you can see in this uh, video is uh, it's, it's a world premiere. Uh, Eodyne is the only company in the world, and even uh, space agencies are not able to retrieve this information. It's the only uh, private company in the world able to, to get ocean surface current information at a global scale on, here in the Mediterranean basin, so with, uh, thanks to the marine traffic. This is just a, a proof of the concept. And just to show you that this is um, um, a global solution, uh, it was supposed to be um, a movie too, but uh, here what you can see is, um, is a map of the Gulf Stream. 
of the US coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to build this map, we, have, we are using uh, uh, about uh, 10 days of IS messages. So this is a, a very new technology. And we are transforming uh, a telecommunication system, AS, in a nurse observation system. So this is a huge difference. And it opens very new applications. So as the story started um, more than five years ago uh, with a patent, and uh, we made some validations uh, with several uh, scientific organizations, and we compared our results with uh, different equipment, such as, such as uh, HF radars, Boyd, rifters, calorimeters, in different areas in the world. Here you can see some results uh, in the Ira uh, in the west of France, comparing some ocean measurements, ocean currents measurement using HF radars. The, the red curves and um, our technology using uh, the, the blue curves. And you can see the tide harmonics and uh, the tide signals and the good correlation we have. Um, we also started to work with uh, space agencies. So we are working with ESA. ESA. We have two, two projects, uh, two, two ongoing projects with uh, ESA at the, at the moment. And we are starting to work with NASA too in the, in the US and GPL in Pasadena. And, um, and uh, so, um, with this work with uh, space agencies and um, um, scientists working for, the, for these agencies, we, we, sh we demonstrated our ability to, so to see, to, um, to, to visualize some signals which were not uh, visualized using some other techniques. So here, what you can see here is a CCD channel, and you have um, um, a feature, a uh, surface current signature, which is called uh, the um, AIS for um, Atlantic Union Stream. It's not AIS as an automatic identification system. It's the Atlantic Union Stream. It's a seasonal current which can, which can appear uh, during the summer. And here it was in May 2016. It appeared at the, on the west side of uh, Sicily. It then propagates south to, to the Sicily coastline and uh, started to vanish uh, by the end of uh, the summer. So that's what you can see here, and we were able to retrieve and to to, to visualize such a, such an event. So you can imagine that it's also the same thing with El Nino or any other important uh, seasonal phenomena. And on the next slide, we should see uh, a movie showing how it propagates along the Sicilian coastline um, during summer 2016. So um, the company is very young, but uh, since, uh, since uh, the, the, our technology is very uh, disruptive and with a lot of promise, uh, we are starting um, an institutional program for research. And um, so if there are some researchers in the room uh, which are interested in uh, discussing with us about uh, our solution to, to get some free samples of our data sets to, to help us to validation on partner in different kind of application. We are open to discussions. And more than that, um, of course, AS signal is uh, one of the key features uh, of the, one of the, the, um, the key data set used in our algorithm. It's not the only one, but it's one, one, of, the, 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 one of them. Uh, we are also interested in discussing with the AS data provider, which can be satellite, satellite AS provider, Opcom, Spire, and uh, Exactors, or any other coastal IS providers, which are also in the room. The more IS data we will have, the, more, the better will be our results. And uh, so there are some, some nice things to do together if you are interested in discussing with us. It's the right moment. We are initiating some strong partnerships at the moment. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. This has added a nice diversity to uh, the topics and over to the uh, last uh, speaker of today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Felix Bessentin. I'm the sales director of Vesadoc, but more or less I feel like the apprentice of Alfred. And um, my topic today is, oh, wrong, this way. My topic today is sustainable fishing, but not on a, um, a very high technology base, but on, based on AIS and cleverly used. Um, what is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUU? 
is a first topic, and you have to imagine that 19% of all catches on average are illegal catches. This is the same, a little bit more on the uh, West African coast. Maybe it's a little bit less in European waters, but I, in average, it is 19%. And this threatens, of course, uh, the maritime environment. Uh, it makes bycatch, catch of juvenile fish and overfishing. And uh, especially in developing countries, it affects the livelihood of the uh, fishermen which live there and maybe are the only um, earning persons in a large family. Um, IUU regulation uh, means also that there is, for example, a law now in the European Union that only fish which is conform to this regulation can be imported. So any um, fisherman in uh, non-EU state has to be compliant to this regulation positively compliant to uh, have the license to import into the e European Union. Um, this is a picture from Global Fishing Watch. Uh, it's uh, in the Mediterranean, and there are really a lot of dots, and if you uh, have them in, in, uh, in mind that 19% of this is illegal, then it's quite, quite an economic disaster for all the legal ones. Um, what can we do? This is an open list, but the main topics are uh, named prevent flag hopping, but we cannot do it IIS, uh, AIS providers. We cannot help this topic. Um, listings, ah, we can equip vessels with tracking systems. We can monitor fishing activities, record the fishing results, and uh, enable the authorities to make the enforcement of this law. And of course, trace the tracking and uh, ensure transparency in the training of the fish. And for uh, the local persons, uh, they have to, be, to acknowledge that there is overfishing. And um, you will see, uh, <laughs> later see the guys. It's important to improve, improve the education and the awareness that there is a problem on the coasts of the development countries. Um, there are three systems in use, satellite, AIS, and GSM. Um, GSM has a very uh, uh, limited range out of the shoreline, so, and satellite is, of course, high technology but uh, you will see that the guys which what we are talking about cannot afford uh, $1 per day or even per week to spend for the transmission to a satellite. Um, this is my first um, uh, picture. This is uh, um, Malaysian fisheries. Uh, my friend Shafrizan was here yesterday. There are 2,400 vessels equipped like this. Along the Malaysian uh, coastline, there are only 12 AIS receivers um, to cover them and get the signals for them. Um, uh, one receiver is on a special place. It's on a mountain 1,800 meter high and 80 kilometers to, the, to inland, but it sees 200 nautical miles out to the water. A very simple, simple build up with this device we call it the VMS track, and the VMS track is mounted together with a solar panel on the roof of such a vessel. It's a standalone system, has no connection to the board electricity. Um, it's fixed there, tamper-proof, um, so any tamper um, try by the captain will be, uh, yeah, a signal will be sent out to the authorities that he has um, tried to spoof the GPS or the power line or the, uh, try to break it out of this mounting bracket. And um, there is a geofencing inside this device. So the coastline is pro uh, programmed. And uh, uh, natural protected areas are also programmed on the map, which is inside this device. So the, the captain of the vessel will be informed by a flashlight that he is in uh, waters he shouldn't go. And, uh, the Coast Guard or the authorities will get an 
AIS telegram that there is somebody in an area where he shouldn't be. Uh, India. Um, this is a, five, um, a test panel of uh, 500 AIS uh, devices mounted at the top. Uh, this time we have no solar panel, so a man has to go up, uh, up uh, the, the mast and remove it for recharging. The device um, makes uh, positive identification. Yes, I am a fisherman. I'm allowed in these waters. And all other, um, mainly from other countries, which are to the uh, west of India, they can be uh, selected by the Coast Guard and uh, can be uh, thrown out of the waters. Um, the last one, and this one, these are really big boats compared to the, to the next one. Uh, this is Mauritania, very small, but they have still an um, autonomous uh, um, system consisting of a solar panel and uh, the, the tracking device. <laughs> And you see that the, sim, uh, the tracking devices, they have to be simple. And this um, device that we use there, it has only two buttons. And one button is the alert button, which is covered separately. And the other one is the on button. And on the solar systems, also the on button has not to be pressed because the system is on every time. Um, uh, simple opera installation, simple operation. There is no handbook for this because a handbook or an operation manual makes absolutely no sense for these guys. They, they will be shown at once the operation and then they know how to. We show them how to mount it, where the best position is, and that's it. It works from by itself, self-explaining. And of course, as I told you, these guys, they have not money for transmission costs is a, is a no operation cost uh, system for them. Uh, normally, they have also not the money for these systems, so the government or non-governmental organizations uh, give them the money to install these devices. This is an advanced system because he has also a rather uh, reflector um, which means that, yeah, this is a, this is a high-end solution for these countries. They can identify the vessel, and if they have only a, a radar signal and no AIS signal with the name of the captain and the name of the, of the board, then they know it's not from there. Why a radar um, a reflector? Because normally these boats are made of wood or fiberglass if they are high class and there's no reflection on a radar from a wooden boat. Um, this is monitoring. And the key points for the small-scale fishermen to use this and accept the system is um, legal behavior is rewarded. Illegal behavior is too risky because any tempering um, try will be detected by the authorities. The safety SC is increased because I have alert button. If I press the alert button on this device, then an IIS SART telegram will be sent out. And um, in these countries, the only help what the fishermen that the fishermen get is from their own community. There is no big uh, coastal ship that gets them out of the water. If they get the help from their own harbor, or they don't get any help at all. Uh, um, so. No operating cost and community. It's always good that all, all of the fishermen have to be treated the same way. They have all to use the system, and they have all the same cost and all the same um, benefits out of the system. Then it is accepted. Um, we all we have realized these projects with this VMS track. Um, very easy. Alfred has called it ultra compact and economic. Um, and one point I have to say here is the last one is Bluetooth connection is included. And this is then linked to a catch app on a mobile telephone. And mobile telephone and smartphones have reached the third world, of course. 
they phone with it, they have internet access with it, and they can make a catch app. And this catch app um, enables them to uh, make the, the catch report which is compliant to IUU. And yeah, this is a more mm, advanced system, but I want to skip this. This is a catch app. This is now one from our Indian um, uh, friend. Um, the fish are, there's a picture of the fish, of course, because you know, the, the, fish, uh, the fish name, they, they divert from harbor to harbor, yeah? from slang to slang in India. They have 50 languages. I, I'm through, of course. And the fisherman just uh, tips the fish he has caught, the weight, and through the track system, he gets the location of the fish, which is also stored in the catch app. And as soon as he gets back to the harbor, via GSM or via um, Wi-Fi, this fish catch report is transmitted to the authorities. He gets a license. He gets a, a certificate for the fish, and he can export it. Yeah. This is how it looks in, in, on the shoreline. One antenna, IIS, and the small boats. Very simple, simple, uh, simple system. And for the small fisheries, this is also scalable and future safe. If they have more boats, they can more, buy more transmitters. And uh, it gives really um, good technology at a reasonable price. And they are compliant to IW regulations. Thank you very much. Because, uh, sorry, we have because time for one, two questions. Yeah, because it's quite quite late now. I do apologize to uh, um, um, our speakers. Um, so exciting, uh, the application that we've been seeing, and such a diversity. Uh, but there will always be the opportunity um, over the finishing beer um, to, to, to speak to you uh, and get into an exchange. <laughs> if there is, let's say, two to three burning questions, uh, then let's have the questions, uh, Carsten, over there. Um, okay, Fred from Sea Shepherd. Uh, thank you. Um, I just am um, interested uh, how much does this little box cost? The transmitter itself uh, costs about uh, 300 euros. And the um, fisherman can use his own mobile phone the catch app depends. We have um, in South Africa applications where the catch app is um, uh, developed and provided by a non governmental organization, which is then for free. Other um, sells us for a small sum. Thank you, Felix. Wow. People want to come that we start the hackathon or they have to uh, uh, go for a beer. Uh, so maybe it's now up to you to say the last words and then I go for the last, last words. Exactly. <laughs> so I would really like to appreciate everybody in the room, both for their patience and their willingness to, to uh, listen to such a diversity uh, of, of topics. Personally, I found it very interesting and I'm really surprised how much new stuff we've gotten um, and how much really uh, there, is, there is progress and that we're getting to a, to a higher level, to more applications, to, to interesting new challenges. So thank you very much to everybody uh, and thank you, uh, my special appreciation really for, for the organizers um, and of course for, for Carsten being the mastermind behind all this. Thank you very much. And, and, and I have to say thank you for, for, for the whole team. So uh, there were a lot of people behind the scenes and I would like to ask them to come up now. Uh, maybe we start with uh, Dries. Dries is an intern from Denmark and he has recorded all the videos, has done a really good job. Dries, where are you? Ah, he's there. So uh, then, then the girls, uh, Joanna, Annette, Jonas, they were doing the technique and everything.
So please come up. Um, I don't know the girls from the kitchen. I don't know where they are. I think they are still doing the wash up. Doing the wash up because we were not allowed to use here the cleaning, uh, the dishwashers for whatever reason. They were too expensive, or we could destroy them. So um, yeah, and then there is of course my my good, lovely, and good friend Jürgen. Without him, I couldn't do this. So thank you, Jürgen, for uh, doing this great moderation for today. I think you even you came as from Lisbon for only this day to support us and doing here the moderation. Thank you, Jürgen. Thank you. So it's it's now the end of the AI summit, but it's not the end of the CDEFCON. We will continue for another twenty four hours where we stay here in the building. So everybody who wants to join us is invited to do so. Uh, we have enough, not food, but beer is still left from yesterday and also from yesterday evening. So um, it will be another 24 hours for us. And then uh, tomorrow we want to show some good uh, uh, applications we, uh, we want to develop. And for those who are traveling home, thank you very much for coming. Uh, have a safe trip home. And uh, of course, Stay with us. There are still some coffees uh, me and beers in, in the kitchen below and also here. And uh, yeah, make connections, make discussions. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see you again. As I told you, one of my goals is to have sometimes an AIS summit not in Hamburg. And uh, yeah, let's see if this dream comes true. Thank you very much and safe trip home. <laughs>